and uh, I'll just share my slide and I will get started. Uh, I'll continue till 2.30. Uh, and uh, thank you again, uh, class, for having me. Uh, what I'll be talking about is uh, collaborative assistance for primarily for health applications, but also beyond promises, challenges, and uh, some ongoing work. Okay, And feel free to stop me at any given time. Uh, so I like to change uh, a photograph. Pardon me? I like that new photograph. OK. <laughs> All right. So here is the uh, plan for uh, the talk. I'll quickly introduce uh, what I uh, mean by collaborative assistants. Uh, we call them by different, different names. Uh, and uh, I'll generically uh, use uh, chatbots as the term. Uh, different types, ways of building them. And uh, I'll give an example of uh, one of the most advanced uh, uh, systems which I've seen in this area. <clears throat> And then uh, I'll talk about what is uh, some of the problems in health, okay? And uh, uh, one of them is uh, inefficiency due to lack of information reuse. I'll just explain what that means. And then I'll talk about, um, you know, a COVID uh, pandemic as a, as a test case of how our various technologies have been there, right? What's the state of the art? So I believe that uh, this whole area of uh, chatbots has been a, a huge underachievement. Okay, uh, so I'll explain why and what could have been done. Then I'll take some examples of how uh, chatbots have been evaluated in the health context and how they could or could not have helped. Okay, uh, and towards the end, I'll talk about some ongoing discussion and conclude. Okay, all right, so just, uh, and, and again, as I mentioned, feel free to stop me at any given time. Uh, what I mean by a collaborative assistance, uh, it is uh, they are systems that engage people in one or one or more people in conversation. Okay, uh, it they can be multimodal. Uh, that is, they can have uh, text, speech, vision, document, maps as part of the input or as the output. Okay, and they can be generic or personalized, and. Uh, uh, they need to handle uncertainties about the natural language, human behavior, and if they're doing a task, then the task at hand. Okay, so some simple uh, characterization can be again by user, like they are one or multiple, modality, the data sources, they are not using any data source, they're simply chatting, uh, static data source, uh, they're telling you about a museum, for example, right? And dynamic uh, data source, they might be telling you about weather and all kinds of things which are changing over time and, and so on. Okay. And I would contend that this is one of the earliest uh, uh, use case of AI. In fact, the Turing test and everything was defined in this collaborative setup. Okay. All right. So you, now I'm, I'm going to be just using chatbots as a, as a way of speaking about them, right? And the reason for having them is uh, that they help in a natural mode of interaction, as we just mentioned. And most uh, organizations or situations, they want to have them because uh, it creates a visible presence of AI technology. It's one of the easiest demonstrations that you have an AI technology available. But they also have a problem in the sense that it's a sequential modality. It's a slow a mode of interaction uh, compared to, for example, a large screen where you can put multiple information there, right? So for example, if I have to tell you how to cook omelet, right? Uh, Alexa bot might just tell you one step at a time. And you may be frustrated, you have cooked um, omelets all your life. And you would say, hey, just tell me this uh, new Hawaiian uh, omelet, just tell me all the steps, I'll know what to do. Okay, so you can, you can end up being totally frustrated. So it is not uh, for every situation. Okay, so the kind of tasks that people try to do are things which are like uh, information retrieval. Okay, uh, then it could be helping people make decisions, right? Complex alternatives are there. And so you're helping people make decisions and they can actually be useful in collaborating and mediation activities. So for example, 
if you are hiring someone right and you want them to be looked at from both technical and personal um, point of views you want to make sure all the different uh, technical areas people have uh, considered them then similarly non technical areas right personality and so on uh, then having a good facilitator is non trivial so you can actually use a chatbot in that kind of a setting so these are at least some of the areas which people have looked at in literature okay i also want to to just quickly level set uh, many of you would have uh, built uh, software systems so what is so special about these kind of software systems uh, so as we know you uh, typical software systems they read uh, data do they process business logic and output the data okay uh, but in the case of uh, chatbot kind of software you also have to be aware of the environment in this case the user is the environment and the the tool the chatbot has to sense the user and act on whatever they may ask you to do right might be on the user or the rest of the environment okay so and they also may use some information they might be judged the behavior of these systems right the testing of these systems is done based on uh, what i'm calling a reference data okay so the real intelligence of any of these systems is is in pushing more and more of the business logic into this reference data so the lesser information you actually put in the code and more you have as a declarative specification the more intelligent the system is so for example if i have a a route finder which just takes tells me how to go from home to the airport as i'm traveling every day right i should not be able to i do not need to tell it that i want to go to the airport it should smartly say okay you're going to the airport take this route right and it knows how i'm i like to drive and so it just suggests me the routes and maybe i'd like a different route every day i do not specify to it but it knows and then it just starts moving that way right so it's getting more and more declarative uh, the information is not hard coded into the system but then testing such a system becomes hard and harder and harder so this is what is meant by adaptive and intelligent uh, software systems so chatbots are a form of such systems and uh, that might be one of the ways to measure their intelligence how little you need to specify and yet your behavior is uh, consistent with what the user wants to make this much more grounded um, i'll take the example of uh, water okay so we go to lakes and rivers and all these places uh you might have heard about this place called flint in michigan where uh, water for certain reason was undrinkable so epa put out a website it's telling people that you look on this water you can drink uh, sorry you cannot drink but you can bathe or you cannot do something and and can do something okay this is like decision support similarly if you go to lake sometimes you have these kind of warnings so whereas you have these static and some usually post facto advisories when someone has gotten sick then only these advisories come up can we actually have dynamic interactive contextual uh, omnipresent kind of decision support which you can use in uh, like water management right if you can have such kind of systems so that's what i mean by uh, real chatbots and their potential I'll just pause here and see if there are any questions or comments. Uh, hi, Doctor uh, Shiraz. So I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, so, if we're trying to build chatbots or any systems with as uh, less interaction as possible, doesn't that mean that we also risk giving control to that device? Uh, I mean, how much control can a user have over his uh, data or anything that he might specify to a device? Uh, I did not say anything about control of uh, the data or the output. Okay, the it, it, so part of the thing would be that uh, so you are touching upon certain things which are uh, uh, important. What I mean by the input here, right, is the system the. so what is intelligence the and 
how much of in, um, specification you have to give, right? Uh, so in any given situation, there are broadly two kinds of things to do, okay? One is what is the decision and how to take the decision, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. So for example, I have laid out three ways of going to the airport, okay? Yeah. I can find that and I can tell the user, here are the three ways, right? And I can do that every other day, okay? Every minute that the person wants to do it, okay? So what is the system adding? Is the system helping you explore the three things, the three choices, right? Now, suppose there are a million choices, okay? I can generate all these choices. Can the person take the decision? Okay, there is a, there is a mental capacity that the person can take the decision or not, okay? So there is a huge spectrum of what the person can do or, or want, uh, can do or wants to do and how much of information you can, the system can make available, right? How much of the decision space you can actually share with the user. So this is, so I would argue that a system which is transparent and allows you to look at the full decision space if you want to, right? Is a completely transparent system and it can still be in the, uh, along the lines of what I just said. So I'm not precluding that. I see. All right, so this is more to do with how do you test the systems, okay? And yes. it, indeed it becomes harder and harder if you don't specify those inputs, how do you test those systems, okay? And that's why testing chatbots and testing uh, Google root finder, right? is such a hard thing. Be uh, believe it or not, there is no publicly available information on how Google has tested its uh, uh, map service. The reason it is hard is because any two people, right, going to the airport at the same time, near the same address even, right, they will get completely different uh, maps and their experience might be completely different. I see, thank you. All right, but a uh, good question. So uh, there are many ways uh, chatbots are built, okay? One of them is uh, what is called a, uh, just assuming a finite state trans, uh, automata. So many of you um, are uh, you know in advanced undergraduate and uh, graduate level. So you would know uh, the FSA. So if the problem is small enough, I can just map out the whole all the states that the system is going to be in, right? And if I can design that, then it's a completely uh, manageable, controllable system. Then there are these uh, frame and slot based systems, okay, uh, where different situations that the world can be in, uh, the information needs are actually uh, decided ahead of time. And then uh, all you do is you try to get uh, values to fill in those frames. Like you are trying to book a flight and you, uh, if the only thing you do, your chatbot does is uh, book flights and hotels, then it will try to it will know the process of booking a flight and it will be asking information and filling those slots and then taking the decision. There are also methods for reasoning, okay? Uh, and learning uh, how the response should be. So essentially here, what's happening is the person is giving the input. You um, are trying to understand the language. You're trying to track the state of the conversation in these cases, you might actually have to retrieve information from external world. Uh, if for example, you're asking about weather or things like that, and otherwise you have it. And then you're trying to generate a response, which is called a policy generation. And then you are uttering the response and giving it back. So you can, this part, right? The dialogue management part uh, can be as a finite street automata frame reasoning, as I just mentioned, and learning based. So the, the hottest area is to actually go for end-to-end -end learning and deep learning based uh, approaches for response generation. But they require a lot of data about what uh, uh, is the input and what should be the right response. So with this kind of a basic uh, uh, background, I'll give you a, a demonstration of a system which is uh, what I would consider one of the most uh, advanced systems in this uh, kind of a situation. Uh, 
it's imagine that a bunch of people are in a room and they are trying to understand about exoplanets these are planets which are outside our our solar system and you have a lot of information from astronomy coming in so you want to look at and understand what is there in this uh, data set okay so this is a system which we worked on and uh, uh, we got uh, one of the demonstration awards at uh, uh, the most prestigious ai conference so i'm just going to be sharing this now So, I'm sorry, we need to in New York. Hello, Jeffrey O'Kephart. Okay. He's an assistant for exploring next about creating an Can you hear my uh, can you hear the voice? Uh, Professor Bitwolf, I think it might be on our screen, the video. Uh, sorry, can you repeat? Uh, is, are you playing a video? Uh, yes, I am playing a video, but it's not shared. Okay, I've got it. Okay, so can you s see my screen or not? Yeah, we can see your I screen. See the, the issue is that uh, when you're playing video, if it's playing in different, um, if you are done embedding, it will play it here and we can see it. But if you, you have your in the video screen and the new screen, I don't know if you can uh, show your entire desktop and show it that way. Okay. So Let it me... depends on what you are sharing. If you are sharing only. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. I'll stop sharing. Okay. Can you see it now? Yep, perfect. Artificial brain, embodied AI is about creating AI is important. This is, is Jeff Gebhardt. Another practical consideration. There are philosophical and scientific, but for the wants and services and exoplanets. Okay. Okay, so this is stellar mass plotted against stellar temperature. Use a maximum of 12,000 and make this a log scale. Okay. Hmm. Watson plot stellar age against stellar temperature. Okay. Okay, so that's interesting. We can uh, look at the individual uh, points. So what is happening here is you have multiple data sets and you have a few people who are exploring data. Uh, you are pointing at data on a wall and you are asking questions and those kind of exploration, exploratory data science is now happening. Which represents the exoplanets. Uh, there's data about both the planet and some properties of their host star as well. So let's go back to the original plot. Watson plot stellar mass against stellar temperature. Okay. All right, now let's drill down on these data. Watson, show me exoplanets with orbital distance, mass, and radius greater than Mercury. Here are 56 exoplanets. Actually, I changed my mind. Watson, show me exoplanets with orbital distance less than Mercury. Here are 554 exoplanets. Okay, and you can see that the plot updates itself to reflect those changes. It's very useful when you're exploring data to be able to change your mind and interact very naturally with the system, which can understand that we only mean to change a piece of our query. It would be very awkward for me to give the whole query again uh, from scratch. One important capability for embodiment is multimodal interaction. And we find that being able to point and talk at the same time is very powerful. The two modes are very synergistic with one another. Tell me more about this planet. Okay. Tell me more about this star. Okay. Notice that you did not specify which that planet was. 
right through the context, the system is able to pick it up. And so here we very easily get access to information about uh, planets and stars simply by pointing to them. You wouldn't want to have to pronounce complicated names like these. Watson, show me this planetary system. Here's a view of the solar system for Trappist-1 with its optimistic habitability zone. So here is the host star, Trappist-1. It has seven planets orbiting it, and several of them you can see are in that green zone of habitability where the temperature is potentially supportive of life. So that's quite interesting. And we can interact with this uh, simulation in various ways if we like. So this illustrates some of the things we can do with visualization. What if relates it to other properties? Well, actually one property that interests me is the distance between a planet and its host star. Watson, can you derive an equation for orbital distance? I can try to derive an equation for orbital distance, but first I have a question for you, Jack. What's your question, Watson? Can you name some properties that you think are likely to be relevant to orbital distance and tell me what exoplanets I might use for analysis? Hmm. Watson, why don't you assume that the properties orbital period, stellar mass, and stellar radius are relevant and use this planetary system for analysis. I will try to derive a physical law from these data. I will get back to you in a few minutes. Okay, so while Watson is trying to derive that equation, let's explore some of the other capabilities. Watson, what other patterns and relationships can you find? You can ask me to find planets similar to another one. Just name the planet or point to it. Or you can ask me to show you planets that are most unusual or most typical. Well, let's explore similarity. Watson, show me exoplanets that are most similar to Jupiter. I've sorted the exoplanets by their similarity to Sol F, also known as Jupiter. Okay, and so we can see there's Jupiter highlighted in the center, and surrounding it, this is a similarity view, so the nodes represent exoplanets, and the links between them represent how similar they are to one another. So the planets that are closest to Jupiter are the ones that are most similar in terms of orbital distance, mass, and radius. Beside this cluster here of Jupiter-like planets, we also have this triad here. And so it'd be interesting to explore that and see what those planets are. Excuse me, Jack. Yes, Watson, what is it? I have derived an equation for orbital distance. Would you like to see it? Oh, yes, Watson, I would like to see uh, the equation you derived. Could you show it to me? I searched the solution space of approximately 661,000 possible equations. Here is a representation of the equation that best matched the data. All right, so I can see it found that orbital period was relevant. It ignored my two other variables of stellar radius and stellar mass. So that's orbital period squared, and that's a cube root there. So Watson is finding that orbital distance is proportional to orbital period to the two-thirds power. And in fact, this is the relationship that was discovered by Johannes Kepler in the early 1600s. It took him about 15 years to discover this uh, relationship. Watson, how did you derive this equation? I used an experimental symbolic model discovery capability that is under development at IBM Research. It uses optimization to derive relationships. Had I been an astrophysicist, Earth and Mars, and as you know, these planets just are much smaller. Talk about another feature. The most unique exoplanets. I rank exoplanets according to their uniqueness. What Watson has done is uh, it's put the most unique planet at the top. That's this one here. You can see that its orbital data fields are present and what you're missing varies a lot across different exoplanets. And if I want to calculate stellar luminosity for HD 4100 works across the board, but our system can handle that. Watson, calculate luminosity. The stellar luminosity for HD 41004B and solar luminosity is 0 0.023875. Watson, how did you calculate luminosity? Here's how I calculated stellar luminosity for HD 41004. So there is another feature, and this is the last feature which uh, I'm referring to. You can ask for certain quantity to be calculated. In this particular case, it was stellar luminosity. And the way to calculate that was through two, three different alternative ways. 
and the system would look at missing information and could reason about what is the chain of uh, of computation which can be done to actually derive that result. So it could ignore certain uh, alternative ways for which it did not have data, and it could still calculate st stellar luminosity, which was the quantity that the person is asking for. Okay. So let me go back to the presentation because this is a big uh, This is a big uh, presentation, the big demo, but I can, I'll, uh, I'll encourage you to look at it, okay, um, at leisure. Can you see my screen again? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what were you looking at? You were looking at multiple capabilities. You were looking at capabilities for data retrieval and comparison. You were looking at similarity between the data points. Okay. You were looking at a dynamic uh, plan generation and function learning. Okay. And the system would do this through a combination of methods. Uh, there was a um, perception where you were uh, trying to look at what the person is talking about and uh, not one person, but multiple people based on cameras and pointing devices, right? Then you were also looking at uh, uh, what are the actuations, meaning what are the things the system can do, right? So you are perceiving, you are doing things, okay? Excuse me. You have a bunch of functions which you could actually do based on whether it was database queries, regression, learning, planning, all kinds of things the systems could come and go. So not all the things would be available. So there was a registry mechanism and there was an orchestrator which was actually looking and orchestrating all the activities. Okay, so the detail about this is more in the paper, but I just wanted to give a sense of uh, what is possible in the whole uh, spectrum of chatbot systems that are there. Any question or uh, comment before I switch to the next part where I want to go get into healthcare domain? Okay, so I would, uh, there are many problems in the healthcare domain, but one of the things which as, uh, um, as a general users, right, we might have felt is this problem of documentation and uh, duplicity in that. So. You're a patient, you go to a doctor, you give them their medical history, okay? They, uh, the doctor might give a prescription and you will fill your forms and uh, go to the pharmacy and get that information. Insurance company keeps uh, information from you, from the doctor's office, from your pharmacy, it decides on the claims. There are multiple documents, uh, multiple times the same information is captured, uh, X-ray reports and various reports, right? the handoff between the role players are inefficient and failure prone. So if you have uh, used health services long enough, you would uh, attest to the fact that uh, uh, you would have filled a lot of paperwork and uh, uh, paid for mistakes by others. Okay, but healthcare is not the only domain. There are many domains, okay? In business, um, in software projects, a lot of people are involved and there can be duplicity in information in e-commerce transactions and so on, okay? So there is the need to go from document-centric to object-centric view uh, in order to reduce this uh, replication, uh, uh, to reduce um, this uh, redundancy and bring in efficiency. So this kind of approach has been done in certain areas, uh, but it actually, uh, uh, is uh, much very much derive, uh, desirable. Uh, healthcare especially, it's uh, very much desirable, okay? I'm not going into the details of what uh, uh, are some of the benefits, but uh, suffice it to say that you go after what is the key information, right? Like uh, the, the patient, their information, and just like object-centric view of um, in programming, you let other people just reuse that information. You don't produce documents every time. Okay, 
So that is one major problem. Then the second uh, thing is that uh, there is not complete clarity in uh, with respect to how these um, AI systems should be built, the regulations which are around them, and how to uh, test such systems. So for, uh, taking the case of COVID-19, uh, this was actually an opportunity in how the systems uh, AI could actually help. It was in understanding the disease, understanding the impact on society, observing the disease in, um, in different ways and uh, detecting it, uh, providing guidance with respect to what individuals or groups can do and what kind of policy actions could be taken. Right? There's a whole bunch of things which could have been done. But in uh, one of the uh, papers uh, which is under review, uh, I actually articulate that there were some pr problems. One was that uh, the chatbots which were created, they had inconsistent ability. What this means is that uh, even for the same situation, right, two different chatbots would give two different answers. So for example, should you be wearing mask? Okay, for this very simple question, two different chatbots done by two very significant um, organizations, they would give wrong answer, right? Different answers, so to say, okay? Then missing differentiation over alternatives. What this means is that if the same information is available over like uh, on the web page, then why do you need a chatbot? And if you can't provide a unique information, why would someone take that technology, okay? Third is inaccessible information to many users, many user groups rather. So for example, in trying to do triaging for uh, uh, medical condition, uh, people with uh, disability, people with various kinds of problems, right, uh, could be easily not considered as a priority group. They were not included, uh, not in, in many languages, right? But this, this is a standard way to build software. So why couldn't they be done in the first go? Uh, ambiguity regarding the user privacy, okay? So this problem was that even at our university and multiple universities, uh, University of Arizona came out with one of the first chatbots for COVID. They could not go and launch big scale studies because there was ambiguity with respect to user privacy, okay? And then how they should be tested, uh, there was not too much of clarity. So many of these problems, right, they led to gaps and uh, hindered the, the uh, adoption of the technology. So what could be done in these conditions? So as I articulate, what we can actually do is uh, for individual different goals, we can do different things. So how can we add value with chatbots? So they're definitely very helpful in certain situations. So for example, they can be very helpful when the, the domain in which you are actually interacting with them, it's very sensitive. So for example, you are talking about uh, depression, you are talking about uh, sensitive personal information and so on. Uh, people are much more reliant on technology than on uh, other people, okay? So we need to find out what is the key value we are providing with chatbots. Then you want to create best practices, okay? So there is a best practice framework which has recently come out from World Economic Forum on how they should be tested and how they align with government processes but, uh, and regulations. But you need those kind of best practices and that they will help probably in some of these gaps. Then what I would argue is that you need not chatbots but chatbot generators software which will take in a design can create chatbots personalized to different situations. And then you can also make chatbots trustable. And I'll talk about some of the ongoing work we are doing in this kind of area. Okay, so I will get to uh, how people have built and tested chatbots uh, in health area next, but I just want to pause here and see if there are any questions or comments. I have a question um, <clears throat> about the processing power required to create a 
usable chat box like or chat bot like Watson. So because Watson uses a huge well, I wouldn't I'm not entirely sure, but I'm sure a large um memory, all that all the kind of stuff. What would it take to make these both usable and accessible to like everyone, you know? Okay. So um First, uh, I'll just like to clarify that uh, the Watson word has been misused. Okay, it refers to many, many things. In and sorry, we used Watson the term in that demo. Okay, but uh, the Watson the the system which solved the game Jeopardy, right? Uh, it was uh, run on large servers. Okay, the system which you saw here, it had heavy instrumentation but the actual system which was running it okay it was just two machines two servers okay but even then we could show a demonstration in a live environment using one machine and just pointing device in a large conference center during the conference i was telling you about okay so it can be downscaled so that was my first answer to this kind of uh, thing that it's not as resource intensive as you would think. But having said that, I would say that there are toolkits which are available. Okay, whether they are, it is Rasa, uh, Rasa is open source. Uh, many others which are out there, right? They have been pushing the development of chatbots almost uh, towards uh, low compute power. But I would, I would mention that uh, they actually depend on a lot of pre-trained um, knowledge and all that, which needs to be created and for which compute is there. So I agree with you partially, okay, because someone has to do it. But what I'm also telling you is that there is a lot of resources available that the actual development effort is not that high. Okay, so for example, chatbot generators, we can generate uh, once the design is there, right, we can generate it in your language or with your variations, right, with a particular persona very easily at a very low cost. In fact, there is a push towards uh, developing a software AI systems without coding. That's like the extreme push that's being made. Thanks for the question, but I, it, is, it is compute intensive, but it is not compute intensive for everyone. That's my main message. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah. What I want to do next is talk about uh, uh, how evaluation of chatbots has been done in health. Okay. And I'm going to talk about two situations. I will give you a positive answer and a negative answer. Uh, the positive answer has been uh, one uh, chatbot which was done to help, uh, to help agents who are helping people select insurance health insurance, okay? So this study came from MIT at some managing intelligence, skilled experts and AI in markets for complex products, okay? Uh, what the problem at hand is that you, this uh, insurance products, right? And uh, uh, Medicare, which is the government uh, uh, re regulated program, which has three parts. One part A, which is uh, covering inpatient hospital expenses, Part B, outpatient expenses. Part D, which is prescription uh, drug expenses. Okay, don't question why they are named all these things. Uh, then there is something called private Medicare Advantage plan, uh, which is a private uh, flavor, uh, a vanilla flavor on top of an ice cream. Okay, and then what you can actually do is uh, <clears throat> uh, you uh, every year. Uh, on marketplaces, and these are can be by private or public, uh, people can go and they can get enrolled. Okay, you there's a phone number, you call, and someone can advise you, and you can select whichever plan you are going for. So there is a company which actually uh, did this, and uh, in two years, 2015 and 2017, this study was done. Okay, and the chatbot was used in 2017. The number of agents were 835 in the first year, 2015, 
732 in the second year, so hardly any difference. Okay, maybe 100, uh, but uh, so is the number of enrollees, so not that uh, significant uh, uh, here. And the average plans in the choice set, which was available, was not that much. Okay, it was 12 plans. So insurance plans, you want to select them, uh, you want to recommend to the agent who is recommending to the first people. Okay, so that's the setting. So the, there was a way that the recommendation procedure, uh, which the system used, okay, to make the recommendation. It looked at the estimated total medical expense of a person. Okay, so suppose I go in and I was looking for the recommendation. It would look at my uh, estimate, uh, my total medical expense for me translate that predicted spending for the my for me into out of uh, pocket cost for each individual j available to that uh, uh, individual k so whoever is uh, close to me translate the op for each plan j available to me into a utility function and put it in on a 1 to 100 point scale okay so the output is that you're giving me a green, yellow, red kind of a three tier custom preference of the plans, right? And the total cost, premium and expected predicted out of pocket. Okay, so the setting is very clear. The AI is giving you a recommendation of what the possible plans should be and uh, the total cost, okay? Now, <laughs> what they found was by using the AI which is the recommendation engine in the context of the agent, you could actually reduce the cost of the plan to the enrollee and you could reduce the call times. Okay, so the call time is for the company which is running the, uh, the exchange, right? And the cost of the plan is for the people who are paying for that expense, right? So by just looking at the comparison here, so they had a metric which was called money left on the table. Okay. So without the chatbot, there was about $1,200 which people were leaving on the table. They could have gotten a better plan which they did not. When the technology was put in, the, the money left on the table, which was like a opportunity which you lost was about uh, $900. The call lengths are reducing, okay. The percentage of people in the plan with a lower cost is actually increasing. And, and uh, people enrolled in the plan that was within $500 of the lowest expected cost was also increasing. So basically it's a win-win for both the parties. What they also noticed was some change in the people's perception. Uh, in 2015, right, consumers were weighing 6.45 times more the expected uh, plan out of pocket than the premium, right? So the premium was being overweighed, okay? Then the out of pocket expense. One is a definite expense, second is a anticipated expense. But in 2017, consumers were weighing premium and out of pocket equally. So you could see the change in the human behavior also, okay? Now these kind of experiments are very valuable, but they're very hard to do, but they're very valuable because uh, these researchers could identify a sweet spot where technology could be helpful, okay? There's another study which looked at how chatbots have been used in medical literature, but this is more towards the care side of it, not the insurance and so on, but more on the care side. And they looked at 14 published uh, conversational agent papers, right? And they found that only half of them, uh, uh, half of the agents, they supported uh, uh, healthcare issues like self-care, right? Patient safety was rarely evaluated. The golden test here is something called randomized controlled trial. This is the kind of trial uh, check which is done when you do your uh, medicine's efficacy, you have a control group and you have a treatment group and you look at what's the impact, what's the difference between the two. They found that one of the chatbots uh, actually made a difference for depression, okay? 
but none of the other systems actually were evaluating it for it. So by and large, chatbots in health, they are not being rigorously evaluated. That's the message. But uh, where it was being evaluated, because, in one of the studies, they found uh, improvement. Yeah, Vipul, I had a question. Uh, yeah. First of all, the safety issue in the healthcare is very important, and, and, and you have rightly identified. Um, it's a very difficult issue. Uh, we, uh, uh, one of our proposals to NSF was, uh, you know, questions, uh, and we did, probably didn't get funded primarily because of that, because uh, in the mental health situation, uh, what if the conversation, uh, you know, you know, what, what if the uh, patient required immediate attention and the chatbot doesn't understand that? Um, so um, there are things we can expect, uh, uh, I would say, as a common sense from human interacting with patient uh, and identifying the uh, severity or urgency uh, that uh, in automated, any, any program system like this may not understand. And, and that uh, could risk uh, patient's health and, and, and hence becomes unacceptable. Uh, the question is, it's such an open-ended problem. How could you have parameters of all the safety things? Uh, you know, we're scratching our brain, uh, our head saying, you know, what are all the things we, we have to do to say, oh, we have a reasonable control over safety that this could not lead to anything. We all are aware of the recent uh, chatbot that was, um, uh, that, that told the patient to commit suicide. Uh, hypothetically, it was not a real patient, but it was tested and uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a test circumstance, the uh, virtual agent uh, asked the uh, mental health patient to commit suicide based on the language model. Uh, so, so how do you, are there any guidance and you know, recommendations on how do you check for safety? Uh so good question. So I have two answers. Okay. The first answer is um, in this kind of evaluation that we are talking about, or that uh, is being referred to here. Uh, it is, uh, you already have to decide ahead of time, why a chatbot, okay, uh, and versus actual care. Okay. So the evaluation is orthogonal in the sense that you, the question, right question is chatbot versus uh, actual personal care, right? And you insert it in a manner that it is non-critical. So that's the first part of the thing. So if you have designed it well, right, the chatbot would anyway be not in the critical path. And so evaluation will not be in the critical path. Why but that would not be in a critical path? Suppose I build, I was building, we are proposing to build a chatbot for managing uh, chronic disease, so, so-called self-management of chronic disease between the two consecutive uh, clinical visit. So if that is the purpose of chatbot, obviously uh, it's, uh, you know, collect, it has to collect the patient's, uh, you know, day-to-day -day change in mood or whatever it is necessary to evaluate whether uh, the patient is, let's say, depressive or is, has bipolar today. And that kind of thing has to be done by the, or that is what we are hoping to do using the chatbot. So safety issues is, is going to be on the path. So I will not get into the specific one. I'm just uh, because then I have a I will question why it was being designed that way. But <laughs> but that, that's a different discussion. I will not get into that. But I'm just telling you that that's a very fundamental thing. But this evaluation is once you have decided to put the chatbot itself, right? How to do the A/B testing? So that is a orthogonal issue. But the second point, which is how should these evaluations be done? Okay. I was telling you about this framework, which uh, World Economic Forum was just coming out with, right, called Chatbot Reset. It tries to go a little deeper into that area of how evaluation should be done and what questions should be asked and what documentation should be kept, okay? But there is no clear right answer, okay? So I should just mention that. Mm. I will quickly move to, um, I, I'm very conscious of the time because I actually, need to rush and I'm really sorry to everyone, but uh, I just simply could not move things around. I need to leave in six minutes. Uh, I want to give use this as a setting to talk a little bit about some of the ongoing work which is happening um, and I'm involved with. One of them is contextual information extraction and reasoning, okay? So just like um, I told you about health, there's a lot of 
environment regulations around like water privacy information around right can i help people understand these uh, documents better using either ai technologies as well as through chatbot technology okay so uh, that is one of the ongoing work the second is we are looking at the next generation chatbots what i'll call next generation chatbots where we are combining some of the deep learning and symbolic methods okay and when i say we i also uh, consider you know some of the work which uh, amit mentioned about knowledge infused learning as a part of that because uh, once you infuse knowledge you can actually do reasoning on top of that okay uh, then generating chatbots directly from data so which means that chatbots which can answer specific to that data uh, if that's the only thing you will do why do you need to develop it you can auto auto generate it okay can be auto generated helping a group of students to learn together with the chatbot right can a chatbot be helpful in a class uh, i'm very interested in the studies on ai and uh, chatbots itself on uh, on people and how do we build trusted uh, ai including chatbots so i will just quickly talk about trusted uh, systems and trusted chatbots so this is a whole area called transparency and transparency through documentation okay so what is transparency through documentation when we look at uh, you know uh, nutrition label or uh, a fact sheet okay uh, you if you have done electronics you might have looked at data sheets of electronic products so you know exactly what this product is going to do what its outcome is or it can be a process level thing you might have heard about iso 9001 how was this produced product produced right what is this food organic okay so that's a process thing similarly documentation can be by producer consumer or independent party okay so in the same way can't we have it for ai okay so that's the idea so um uh, i along with my collaborators have been working on this idea about rating ai services for from third party perspective okay and uh, uh we have worked on um, uh so for example translator services um, machine translators uh, we can talk about uh, 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 these translators being uh, uh data um, unbiased data sensitive bias meaning that they are not biased but with the data you can manipulate and make them biased or they are uh, uh, unbiased compensating system they can be unbiased and they can compensate for any bias in the data right and similarly we have done some work on uh, uh, how to make uh, and test uh, chatbots for uh, bias and rate that okay so i'll just give you a peek into this and i'll refer to one of the papers which will give you some more detail about it but these ideas can be extended to uh, more modality we have only focused on text so with audio images and multimodal ai services lot more can be done so that's part of my ongoing work okay so this is the paper i was referring to uh, rating of chatbots and uh, the key so suppose uh, this is a train uh, a chatbot right telling you about uh, trains and their timing okay the problem that can come here is that the chatbot can leak information if it can tell that everyone is go trying to go from place a to place b then we know uh, there might be crowding on that train okay or at that destination so other people can change their policy or whatever okay the chatbot can be abusive it can give responses which the person may not understand so for example no one talks about hw hwh station the place might have a name like a havra so you don't no one says nyc right you say new york and uh, no one says new york city okay uh, so can you uh, it can give complex uh, responses abusive language things like that okay so if we have chatbot can we handle these cases and can we test against them so the good news is that there are ai based checkers which can uh, detect uh, you know like abusive language uh, complexity and bias those kind of things can be checked including some work which uh, some of uh, amit's uh, students had earlier done also on twitter what we can do is use these things right and in that kind of context our systems 
combine and we give uh, ratings like is the chatbot trustable is it model sensitive meaning that if you change the model the output might vary a lot data sensitive if i change the data which uh, through which the response is being given like the trained data right will it be or the training data will the output change user sensitive if people of different backgrounds answer the same question will and the response change or not and so on and to do that we have a machinery by which we rely on current checkers to get you the results right and it can also be integrated as part of a running chatbot so you can do it on chat conversation logs or you can also integrate it with actual chatbots and look at how the outputs are so this is one where we actually integrated with a uh, running chatbot and we could uh, look for abusive language and things like that okay uh i will just want to be uh, uh, cognizant of time uh, so in conclusion uh, chatbots represent a very uh, good way to engage with people uh, i hopefully picked your interest and showed you the wide variety that is possible but ai has a problem of trust and uh, uh, i think that uh, there are some very promising ideas here uh, and uh, if if you're interested uh, feel free to talk to me yeah questions comments any last minute comments very happy to answer all right thank you very much uh, biplo um, i'm sure students enjoyed them we will have a video of this and post uh, for the use by the students all right thank you thank you i need to i needed to rush i'm really sorry for that I noticed that. Yeah, thanks. Bye.